in the gloom, let's start. Um, welcome one and all. Um, hope you enjoyed your short summer break, if you managed to have one. Um, so let's start with item one, apologies for absence. Um, we have an apology from Mark Wilkinson. Declarations of interest. How do we use this now? Yes, get a house in my wall. Yes, uh, Although not a member of this uh, committee, yeah. uh, item 14 relates to uh, uh, a contract with the uh, HDS. Uh, by virtue of being a contract with the HDS, I'll go to the of the HDS. And if there's a discussion on the side of the room. Sorry, Chair. Uh, although I'm not a member of this committee, can't declare an interest in Jenner House as it forms part of the Alcala Group. Indeed. I declare an interest in Jenner House as I live in Alcala. Sorry, it's not my boy. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Right, so. Um, as you all noted, let's move on to item 3, the minutes, pages 4 to 12. Uh, are we content that those are a rec an accurate record of our meeting in the last? Matters arising. Okay. Uh, that's okay. <coughs> okay. Um, it relates. Relates to uh, item 24, written questions from councillors. Yeah, uh, page, uh, page 11. Page 11. You you will recall, I think the committee will recall that you uh, had a uh, eight minute uh, uh, reply to the question. Sorry? It was indeed. I uh, checked it on uh, YouTube or something. Oh, yeah, that's both the outer and the supplementary. But there were a couple of comments in there which uh, are worthy of comment for the mm -hmm. analysis. For example, in the supplementary, you said, and I quote from the minutes, Harlow had to borrow a quarter of a, quarter of a billion pounds to buy its own council houses. However, the rental income covered the interest on its loan and some of the capital. Uh, if you go back to full council uh, 12th of February 2012, uh, the, the housing management 30 year plan uh, approved the borrowing of 208, 208 million, which is near a fifth of a billion, not a quarter of a billion, uh, which was entirely repayable over the 30 year life of the business plan. So it could repay both the interest and the capital. That's how the scheme was set up to do. You also went on to say, based on that paragraph, that um, as a result of the, uh, what was it, uh, the four years reduction in rent, is damaging your ability to repay the loan, and we have, uh, we've been forced to take out. Uh, we are now, we are able to pay only the interest, okay, and so increased borrowing is simply out. Well, <coughs> bearing in mind that uh, rent increases are starting again next year. A resurrected 30 uh, year uh, business plan will provide for a payment uh, of those loans, and therefore any new loans taken out to, to, to build can be repaid from the rental income of the new properties over a 30 or 60 year uh, period, which is the expected lifespan of the asset. And um, just a final comment. Uh, uh, questions, I think. It's under no, matters arising. Matters sure. arising. He's quoting okay, what you said. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> and just one final comment. Uh, the original idea for the reform of the national uh, HRA was first made by uh, John Healy, who was then uh, housing minister in 2009. So it wasn't a conservative idea. Uh, yes, Councillor. Um, thank you. It would be clear about the 205 million. Eight. 208 million. That's clear. 
over the 35 year period, 30 years, <laughs> over the 35 year period, it would actually, because we've had to delay some of the payments, would actually come out at about what you were talking about, Chair. So we should actually be quite clear what we're talking about. You've made your comment. Councillor Carter, I think you've made your comment, and now people are responding. So I, I thank you to wait your turn and go through the chair. Councillor Davis. No, it's good, Chair. It, it, it's right what you said. Oh, good, thank you. Um, Councillor Carter, I'm going to comment. You can, you can indicate you want to speak. And then when I am ready, I will ask you to. But, you know, as I tell my year 10s, putting your hand up and shouting out is not a polite way to behave in a classroom, and it is not a polite way to behave here. Thank you. Oh, come on, come on. Thank you. Um, so, I am confident in the veracity of the reply that I gave you. I spoke at length to our finance officer and he supported me in the things that I said there. I think the comment was, there is nothing in there that isn't a statement of fact. Apart from him getting all the numbers wrong, uh, he implied that because of the delayed attack, because of the delay of payment uh, of the debt, uh, we will end up paying more. Well, you've already said that at the moment we are paying the interest on that debt. debt. So the debt is not increasing, we're not borrowing anymore, and we are covering interest. So the 208 million remains at 208 million. Yeah. Interest. I think. Yes, you're paying interest, for God's sake. Through the chair. And I think the substantive point here is that the. Um, the initial loan was huge and we were required to take it out. And that changes in the rent reduction has affected our ability um, to repay the loan as we hope to and has affected our, our ability to um, borrow more at the moment. Things may well change. Jack, can I just have one more? I'm we're happy to, but then I want to move on. Yeah. We were debt free. We paid for the housing from the developer corporation. We were debt free. And the Tory government imposed on this town over £200 million debt. There's nothing to be proud of or to shout from the rooftops about. It's a disgrace that that happened. It was your idea. Right, um, moving on. Quite lost my place. Um, Questions from the public, there are none. Written questions from councillors, there are none. Petitions, there are none. So we move on to item 8, the forward plan, pages 13 to 27. Councillor Harper. Thank you. Uh, under item uh, IO 10, 27, the development plan, um, page 16. Um, a point of clarification, which has arisen from the uh, EPIC inspector's report. Uh, we can, I think this is Dan, Dan Burton, confirm that there's not to be a gypsy traveller's site uh, in East Harlem. Uh, there's nothing in the plan, Chair. The inspector made a specific reference to a gypsy uh, and traveller site page on, on page 9 of the report, section 34. Oh, section 34, thank you. There's nothing in the Harlow local plan with provision for traveller sites in the to the East of Harlow, and there's nothing in the proposed modifications to the plan and to that effect either. And we don't refer to gypsies. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. To, to Andrew Vanridge, on page 9 of the inspector's report for the Epping local plan, where it refers to the East of Harlow 
master plan area. Part 34, which relates to our local plan, refers to a traveller's site. Did you read the inspector's plan in relation to the east of Harlow master plan area? Because it says it plain as day on page 9. Right, first of all, this isn't on our agenda. Um, and are you able to answer this or do you want to come back to that later? I've been answering now and maybe provide more detail written response. Well, let's try and stick to the agenda thereafter. There, there are no requirements within the Harlow local plan to provide that site. That if the Epping inspector has made comments around the Epping part of the east of Harlow site, then that's a kind of forest hill, not Harlow Council. Yeah, exactly. I suspect you're, you're bringing us up in the wrong uh, venue. Um, but it's very clear answer. Thank you. Let's stick to the um, agenda. Thanks, Mr. Jones. IO 10207 Local Development Plan Approval of Modifications Prior to Consultation that's coming to the meeting in the next meeting. Will that officer's report include a full report on any provision for traveller sites within the east of Harlow planning area? I'm fairly sure that's been answered, but let's do it again. There is there will be no reference to traveller sites in the proposed modifications to come to cabinet. I really think that's a very, very clear answer given the circumstances. So, are there anything else to do with the um, full plan? Good. So, um, are we agreed to note that full plan? Agreed. Lovely. So, now let's move on to item 9 recent decisions taken by the Reading Deputy of Portfolio. I hope it has relevance to be this um, space. So, we'll move on to item 10. The Joint Finance and Performance Report, quarter 1, 2019 to 20, and you'll find that on pages 28 to 49. Um, who's going to move that? So moved, Chair. And I will second that, thank you. Um, Councillor Danvers, do you have um, to say on that matter? Well, if we could control the service budget um, being maintained in the quarter, uh, there is a forecast overspend of um, 215,000. The variations are, are dealt with on page 42, Chair, um, and obviously I'll be prepared to answer any questions. So, questions then? Indeed, they need their own. Councillor Carter. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, just confirm I had given notice of this question. Uh, page 43 uh, of the entry report, section 4, service based analysis. Um, there is no report from place on that page or the succeeding page, which is unhelpful because the only sizable variance uh, on page 42 is actually an undertake for the enterprise of £215,000, which I'm sure by coincidence is the uh, net uh, uh, overspend reported on uh, page 28. I think so, um, we're in the process of uh, realigning the table on page 42 for quarter two. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that for quarter one to re uh, reflect the changes that have been put in place for the overall structure of the council. So, the um, service based analysis is focused around the new um, service groupings, whereas page 42, unfortunately, at quarter one, was only able to reflect the old service groupings, which included pay services. Oh. Thank you. Any other questions? What? <coughs> <Wait. coughs> just, just on that, I mean, uh, it is a substantial uh, variance, and normally, uh, for some examples, there will be some explanation as to how it arose and what steps are being taken to ameliorate it. So, in, in response to the question on the particular entry in the table on page um, 42, um, the uh, variance of £215,000, the uh, majority of that variance is offset by the variance below head of place services, and that will be reflected in the quarter two report when the table is aligned to the new service groupings. The difference between um, the uh, element of the variation and the total 
is in relation to costs that we've had to incur in dealing with costs associated with the CPO process on the uh, enterprise zone land for which we've been through a CPO process. Thank you, Jess. CS50, average waiting time of calls received by contact Harlow. Note the um, over-doubling of um, waiting time for callers to contact Harlow in quarter one. And I understand the explanation there of a retirement and a maternity leave causing that problem. My question is, did we not know that someone was going to retire and did we not know that we were going to have a maternity leave? Absolutely, indeed, neither of those is coming to surprise to us, Councillor Johnson. Um, in addition, there's a, a seasonal variation which came into there, which we planned for. We also had some additional um, illnesses which weren't planned, which were further pressure the service. And um, the good news is that in the months subsequent to this report, we're very much back on track. Yeah, that, that, that's very good news that we're back on track, and it's very good news um, that we were able to cope with that. However, the explanation that we've been given as councillors there, had I not asked that question, was just that it was down to a retirement and a maternity leave. There was nothing about seasonality in the report. There was nothing about the ex excessive illness that you've just mentioned as a helpful clarification in the report. As a member of the opposition, I, I'm not subject to those access uh, items that you've got there. I'm reading the report in front of me. So if there is real mitigation for these reasons, can we have that in the mitigation comment, please? Point taken, uh, Councillor Johnson. I have my explanations to that as well. It was, thank you. Any further questions? Good, so I think um, we are. Are we then, I've got that to the page, 28. Are we happy to accept the recommendation A, parts 1, 2, and 3? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Thank you. So now we're moving on to item 11, the Housing Revenue Account, quarter one finance report, 19 to 20. Who's moving that? So moved, Chair. And I will second that, and you'll find that on pages 50 to 56. Um, once again, um, good financial control being maintained, and the report highlights that there's a forecast underspend of uh, £140,000. Uh, um, given the size of the budget, that, that, that's quite, in my opinion, quite acceptable. Um, the underspend is directly linked to the additional revenue funding required to support the housing capital programme as a result of uh, the carry forward uh, schemes approved at the July cabinet. And once again, if members are interested, the details are on page 55 and 56. And once again, I'm quite happy to answer questions. For you. Thank you. And are there any questions? Councillor Carter. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, and again, I have a good notice of this question. Um, page 51, paragraph 4C. Uh, the impact of new gas contract has not yet been recognised in the invoicing received, and any additional costs in the HRA are in part recoverable from tenants and leaseholders. What I'm concerned about here. Uh, is that uh, tenants may receive <coughs> backdated bills or substantial uh, increases. I'd like to know what the uh, landlord is doing about that to prevent that. Thank you. Um, Andrew. I think uh, it's safe to say that it's too early to say. I think uh, what has happened is that we have introduced <coughs> a new heat meters to determine usage, which has been very helpful and with the new methodology that we're going through. And this will enable actual consumption to be gauged, and that's matched against the new energy uh, framework which we are operating under. And uh, we're moving towards over the coming months to roll that out, uh, and we'll be uh, providing more information in the future. Okay, well, okay, so that thing to do I think in the past, there's been three or four different methodologies where there's the before and after, and we'll be gauging that as to what that means for each individual tenant and leaseholder, and we'll be recharging appropriately, but we'll be notifying them accordingly. Thank you. Any further questions? Right, so. 
Um, are we happy to accept the recommendation A, parts 1 and 2, and B? Agreed. So now let's move on to item 12, capital programmes, quarter one finance report 2019-20, which you will find on pages 57 to 21. And um, who's moving that? So moved, Chair. And I'll second that one as well. A um, number of things here. The housing capital programme shows the capital expenditure is forecast to be um, uh, 23.7 million, um, which, is, which is below the budget. And once again, the details are in place. Uh, the housing capital programme, um, the forecast is uh, 15.6 million, and once again, that's, that's under um, that, the, the reasons given once again. Pages 69 to 71. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, uh, page 59, paragraph 13, <coughs> building council homes. It's going to be a theme one of the Bushycroft Lamb Hatch, preparatory work on Bushycroft took commenced in 1819 to deliver 60 additional homes with a budget in 1920 of 2.6 million. Seems, what, seems quite straightforward. Then turn, oh, turn the page over to, to uh, paragraph 14, table 1, uh, which shows uh, the readings of Bushycroft uh, as being uh, a couple of allocated in 1920. But Mark the carryover, which would seem to indicate that it's not going to be done in 1920, but in 2021 instead. So I'm wondering if somebody can provide some clarity as to uh, when those properties are actually going to be built and what impact it has on retaining capital receipts, bearing in mind the three year rule, which is what I'm talking about. The um, indication in table one is that the, the delivery of the um, final scheme uh, will roll into um, 2021, uh, but at the moment we're waiting for um, the uh, prices to be returned for the actual construction of the site. And um, in terms of the uh, capital receipts, the pool receipts that we are holding at the current time, we are forecasting that we will still be in a position to be able to utilise all of the receipts that we've held back from the pooling arrangements. So you'll be able to spend it within the three year period? That's our current estimate, yes. As the year part. But you don't know when you're going to start building, and you don't know when you're going to complete them. Well, I think, I think the answer to the question is clear. You ask the question, will, um, this, will we have to be giving this money back? And the answer is no, we will, we will have a way of answering that. But not when the house is going to be built. You don't know when you're going to start building these houses, and you don't know when they're going to be built and handed over. I don't think that's what I said, actually. What I said was that we have started the process for the pricing for the contract and that that, had, that will lead to a slight delay in the spending of the capital funds, but that actually they're anticipated to be delivered in 2021 as a completed scheme and that we will not have to pay any pool proceeds to the government. So, so how does this work be completed until 2021? That's what I just said, yes. Yeah. Although, paragraph. Uh, 13D, so they're going to be uh, built in 1920. There seems to be some confusion between one and the other. No, no I, think, I think the confusion is that paragraph D says that the budget was allocated for 1920. It doesn't actually say the properties were anticipated in that line that they would be completed in 1920. It says the budget was allocated, but I think, I think the words that you're um, using don't actually aren't reflected in paragraph D on page 59. Okay, does that help? Okay, well, I'm sure that Mr. Freeman will find you some time if you need that explained in further detail. Um, I ought to. Any other questions? Good, so we are.
So are we happy to accept recommendations A and B on page 57? Agreed. 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 So now we're moving on to the Annual Treasury Management Report 2018-19, to which is on page 72. I formally move to. Thank you, and I second it. Do you want to say anything on that matter, Councilor Danvers? I know, any questions? Any questions you want to bring to us? You have a good old chat amongst yourselves. I take that that's a no. So therefore, are we happy to accept recommendation on page 72? Agreed. Thank you. <coughs> so, moving swiftly on, um, item 14, the building cleaning contract. And you will find that on page 84. Who's moving that? Fine, Jack. And second? Thank you very much. Um, that's a Stracken. Thank you, Jim. Uh, well, money. Should we get? I'll, I'll leave the room. Indeed, thank you. Thank you. Well, if he chooses to, I'm not going to lie. Off you go, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Uh, most of it is contained within the report, but obviously, uh, part and parcel of creating HTS is to be able to deliver services or for them to deliver services and actually build better value to the council. Uh, and as the contract was up, uh, it was actually without saving money by not doing that standard process and actually bringing the services or giving the services up to the HTS. Excellent news. Any questions? Oh, Councillor Edwards. Yeah, just a question. Is that one of our aspirations is that all staff should look beyond the living wage and spot sorry, one of our aspirations is that staff should be on the minimum of the living wage. And I just wonder whether or not this is, that's been taken into account at night in the two P or the discussions that are currently being had for HDF. Uh, yes, uh, the two P process has actually already identified that. Uh, that all staff that come across will be on the living wage. Uh, part of that's under conditions. Well, I think that's good news. I think everybody should be paid on the living wage. Yeah. Um, if there are no other questions, are we happy to accept recommendation A, parts 1 and 2 on page 84? Agreed. Thank you. So, yes, indeed. Um, let's move on then. I won't actually start any questions, but I can get the title out of the way. The disposal of land adjacent to the old Harlow Medical Centre, which you will find on pages 88 to 91. And again, I think. I'll be moving in, Jim. I'm happy to second, but I'm going to go for questions, Jim. Okay? Yep. Thank you, Jim. Uh, same again, most of it's uh, contained in the report, but we was approached by the uh, Health Centre and CCG that about a very small piece of land that they would be interested in purchasing to actually deliver a better service to the residents of Old Carla, uh, and we're quite happy to facilitate that. Sounds very straightforward. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've got three questions, if I may. Um, can, can you give me some assurance, whilst I would completely welcome this uh, uh, initiative, uh, can you assure me what the implications, if there are any, in relation to the current NHS funding that's actually allowing the practice uh, to go forward and, and develop this? I'm worried about the timescales, so that's question one. Uh, do you want me to do the other two as well? Uh, I'll do one at a time, if that might oh, okay. be so the time scales we envisage, obviously within the we I think it's eight months within the report that it'll be done. But actually we envisage it's going to be a lot faster process than that. But the eight months is well within the envelope of the time that they've got to spend the money. So it's well within that. Uh, uh, yeah, well. Okay, I hope so. Uh, in relation to the uh, second question, um, I'm a little bit concerned that whilst we're selling off council land, and um, this is going to be 
board for health provision. Uh, as we know in Potter Street, uh, the health service can sometimes change their minds. And what assurances will we put in place that actually if, if uh, there is any change in health provision, we can protect that land and bring it back to the council? Normally that would have a, within the agreements, the legal agreements, that we not only will it have to be used for the purpose that it's intended for. So there has been an uh, assessment of it and the current parking arrangements are actually, there's more parking than what they actually need most of the time, but there is a, an agreement in place to use the parking across the other side of the road. So there should be plenty of overspill parking for any staff and anybody busy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Garnett. I have a question, question and comment from you, Chair. Um, I, was, I was approached uh, about... To the question. Shall I talk to the question first? Yeah. What was that? Well, the question, question is yeah. first. Like, well, um, Councillor... Uh, mentioned it the eight months and I find that rather a lengthy period because I think there is some urgency to get this um, new build up and running because they need the they're going to build four consultation rooms there and with the pressure from Newhall and Gildon Park they need it as quickly as possible it's already been about three months in a negotiation since I first brought it to the attention of uh, the council is there any way of rush, pushing that through I'm very grateful for that, for that question. Um, we recognise eight months looks like a long time, um, and we appreciate the urgency. You're right, it is an urgent uh, build, uh, and it needs to be run that faster. But we only work at the time scales that they envisage at maximum. But we, all parties envisage it can be a lot, lot faster than that. A lot faster. Okay. It's just the time scales that they've got in maximum time scales. Can I come back, Jim? Um, can I have the questions first? Is this another question? Or is it, um, no, I really I wanted to explain the situation. Yeah, I will in a second. I will in a second. Okay, all right. Okay. I've got a question. So let's, let's do a question. Yeah, so just on um, part six on page 89, around the eight months um, transaction period, what would be helpful to the ward councillors is if we could just be made aware of where the time scales actually finally land. Um, as the work continues on this. Clearly, because we're board councillors, we want to be cited on something that is very important in terms of increasing primary care capacity in, in Jenner House. Uh, Councillor Charles, that's a perfectly reasonable request, and we will meet it. Any other comments? We've got comments. Any questions? Right, comments. comments. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, as I said, I was, I was approached by uh, Dr. Anthony a couple, two or three months ago about this, that they were desperate to... Uh, uh, expand on this site. They didn't want to be forced into going to Gildon Park, which they couldn't afford anyway. The, the CCG couldn't afford it, so they asked me to take this forward, and I spoke to, to Brian, and he took the cutters up from there. I've had various conversations since then uh, as to how it's going, and it's obviously they, they want to, to get this up and running. As you said in your opening, it is a very small site, it's just a patch of concrete which has a uh, Probably it takes about six cars in there, which are the nurse, nurses generally are only visiting uh, doctors because they've got their own car park as well. Um, but it, it is, it, it is, you know, we do, and I said to Dr. Anthony, we don't want them to move to Gildon Park because most of the, the residents in Old, so I shouldn't say this, but are fairly elderly and they, to try and make their way from Old Harlow up to Gildon Park is, is, is not easy. So. I'll ask you to, to perhaps in negotiations, I'm not, not financially, but if you bear in mind, it is just a patch of concrete and it's, it's, it's useless to anybody. And this is probably the best thing they can do with it, is put a small little building extension. But I, I don't, I'd like, wouldn't like you to see that, you know, you think it's the golden egg uh, because it's CCG, whatever, whatever they pay us has got to come out of the CCG's budget. So if, if you can bear that in mind in, in negotiations, thank you. Yeah, can I first of all welcome the fact that this um, initial discussion that was kicked off between Dr Anthony and Councillor Garnet 
then subsequently with Brian to tee up the conversation with Harlow Council who has progressed to this report tonight. We have an ageing population in Old Harlow and it is very important that we increase the capacity of GP provision at Jenner House. Um, the, the facility of having four additional consultation rooms will not only help the existing population but the future growth plans that are set out by the council. Whether you agree with them or not, um, it is important to make sure that the capacity is there to make sure that our ageing population in Old Harlow is looked after and the wider health needs. I am concerned about the time scales and I am grateful for the fact that the council will, in a timely fashion, provide us with the accurate time scales. The only other point I would make, and I, and I do see where Councillor Durkin is coming from on this, but I think that this land should be handed over to, um, the, uh, to Jenner House without restrictions because we need to make sure that that land then becomes a fundamental part of Jenner House and can be used for health and well-being um, in, in, in the Old Harlow area. And I think that's really important. I, I can understand where Councillor Durkin is coming from on this, but you wouldn't blame me as the Old Harlow Ward Councillor to be, to be championing the fact that we have a fantastic practice manager at Jenner House and GPs and of course the work of the West Essex CCG in moving this ward is positive. It hasn't been positive in other parts of the town and I recognise that. But this is a good news story for Old Harlow and I thank my colleague Councillor Garnet who's teed up this conversation with the council and the ongoing work that will progress as a result. Thank you, uh, Councillor Charles. Now, I think um, my understanding of what Councillor Strachan said, he made it very clear that this land will be made available to Jenner House as long as it remains a health centre. So it's perfectly protected as long as it remains a health centre. But unfortunately, the, the reality that we've seen in Oslo House, for example, is that um, GP surgeries are operating as quasi-private businesses. And so if something were to happen, we wouldn't want to lose that land. And I think that's perfectly reasonable because something would have to happen first. Whilst it's a health, um, uh, health centre, whilst it's a, a surgery, that land will remain um, as part of it. Um, and thank you for recognising that whilst this is good news for Old Harlow, much of the rest of the Harlow doesn't have that good news. In fact, it's very bad news. Oslo House was bad news for the residents around it, many of whom, Councillor Garnet, are elderly and don't need to travel as they now have to to other um, doctor's surgeries. It's increased the pressure on the Hamilton surgery, which is my own surgery, where on four occasions I've tried to get a doctor's appointment in the, and there are none available within the two-week period that they'll go to. Um, and I believe the same is true for Keats House surgery, which is um, Keats surgery, which is facing the same crisis of demand and lack of supply. So good news for Jenna, but it's not, um, and let's celebrate that, but let's not um, oh, ignore know. the crisis across the rest of Harlow. Make a comment on that, you know. Thank you. Perhaps they ought to have a word with Dr. Anthony and see how they manage to, to make it so efficient. the uh, debate about what is happening in, in primary care, the, the point that I was making is that whilst we're agreeing something today, we've got to think about what happens in 30 years time. And actually, if we think about the people they weren't sitting in this chamber when Potter Street was designed, I don't think anybody at that time envisaged that we would be losing something. So all I'm trying to suggest is that it does give us a point of protection for a legacy uh, just in case. And finally, uh, primary care is moving in a very different direction. So whereas at the moment we have uh, GP surgeries in different areas, uh, if you actually look at the health economy and where we're going, and if you look at what is happening at Lister House, that may well be a model that we will all have to face uh, sometime uh, in, in the future. So all I'm suggesting is actually a legacy to protect our position when most of us will no longer uh, be around. He'll still be around. But he'll still be around. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. Um, I don't think we need to debate this anymore. Are we happy to uh, accept recommendation A? Agreed. Oh, sorry. Am I? Are we happy to accept recommendation A? 
be happy to rec uh, accept recommendations A, B, and C. Thank you. So now let's move on to item 16 communications from committees, working groups, parties, and panels. A, this is a referral from the Religious Diversity Working Party. You'll find it on page 92 to 99. Um, Councillor Shears. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so this is just an update on what's been going on. Is due to come to um, cabinet in December um, with final recommendations. So um, I hope you find any information useful. I should have said that I'm seconding. Uh, any questions on that? Happy to uh, accept recommendation, ma'am. Agree. Good. So I'm proposing that um, we note the minutes of um, the Harlow Local Highways Panel, pages 100 to 121, and the minutes of the Cabinet Overview Working Group. Are there any questions on those? Noted? Noted. <coughs> thank you. Um, I've not been made aware of any other business, so thank you all for coming. I'm glad to meet you.